Luke chapter 23. Can you hear me now? There you go. Thank you, choir, praise team, praise band. Mm. I love to praise my God. Luke chapter 23, and we'll begin at verse 34. We're starting a we're starting a new series of messages, about seven messages. We're going to be looking at the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. But the title of the series is Seven Principles to Living a Life of Freedom and Fulfillment. Seven Principles to Living a Life of Freedom and Fulfillment. You know, in Galatians 5.1, Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, said, It is for liberty that Christ has set you free. And in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 8 and verse 36, Jesus, it says, he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And then in the Gospel of John, chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. God has called his children, the Christian, the child of God, we're called to a life of freedom, a life of peace, a life of joy, a life of contentment. But my experience is that a lot of Christians aren't living in a life of freedom. They're living in a life of bondage, really. Uh, again, in John 10, uh, cha uh, verse 10, Jesus, before he said, uh, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly, he said, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we look at that oftentimes, and not necessarily wrongly, but oftentimes we look at that as that lost soul. He's come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. But we also have to understand that, that the devil is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy you and I. He's trying to steal our freedom. He's trying to kill our joy. He's trying to destroy this, this, this faith that we have to keep it from being an effective witness here in this world. And so many Christians, we, we've come to receive, we've come to believe, we've come to confess, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. But now the devil, the demonic world, the world, the, the, the demonics, the world, and the flesh are all battling to put us back in bondage. The devil is continually tempting us and coming against us. The world is, is coming against us with everything it has, and even our own flesh is trying to put us back in bondage and keep us from living out this life of freedom that God has called us to. I absolutely believe with all of my heart that, that we're called to live in this freedom, that we're called to walk in freedom, that, that we're called to, in, in this world that we live in as believers, we are to be a free people. Our sin puts us in bondage. The devil puts us in bondage. The world puts us in bondage. Our flesh tries to put us in bondage. Uh, we, we oftentimes get entangled in the very sins that Christ died and set us free from. These things are always coming against us. And then if it's not bad enough, oftentimes the religion that we're a part of is trying to put us back into bondage. Look to your neighbor and say, God called you to be free. We are he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And so the next several weeks, we're going to look at what Jesus said while hanging on the cross of Calvary. And, 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 and what, we, what we're going to do here is espouse seven principles for living a life of freedom and fulfillment. So principle number one is forgiveness. If you need a title of the message, it would be, and you've all heard this, to err is human, but what? To err is human, but to forgive is divine. Or we could call it, I'll never forgive, I'll never forgive what they did to me. Because that's certainly the attitude of a lot of Christians today. I, there's a lot of Christians sitting in church today, believers, I'm not talking about lost people, believers who are sitting in church today that are all bound up because of what happened last week, last year, last decade. And we're held in this bondage because we can't forgive. We can't forget. We can't let go 
of what happened yesterday. Let's, let's look at our scripture, Luke chapter 23. We'll begin with verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. Father, we come in the name of Jesus this morning. And God, as we begin this series and this message this morning on forgiveness, God, open our mind, open our heart and spirit to receive what you have for us. Father, I do believe that you've called us to live a life of freedom, a life of faithfulness, You've called us to live a life of peace, joy, and contentment. God, let us hear your word this morning. Speak to us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So the first thing Jesus said on the cross of Calvary is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And some Bible scholars think that it's not when he was actually lifted up on the cross, but Jesus was actually, and I don't know how they know, so don't ask me, but it's interesting. It's just but while he was being nailed to the cross. The cross was laying on the ground. Jesus had been laid upon the cross, and there on the ground they drove in the nails, the nails in his wrist and the nails in his feet. And while the nails were being driven into the hands and feet of the Son of God, it was there that he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Man, what kind of forgiveness is this? Well, it's the very same forgiveness God has called us to extend to other people. Unforgiveness, anger, bitterness, resentment, malice are all actions of self that promote death in one's life. Unforgiveness, anger, bitterness, resentment, malice are all actions that's, that are all actions of self that promote death in one's life. You know, most of us are on social media. And, and, uh, and, and we get on social media, Facebook, and, and, and we all have our friends. And, and for a lot of us, most of them are Christian friends. And so we're, we're going through and we're reading the post of the day. And it's amazing to me at the people that, that I watch on Facebook that, are, that, that claim to be Christian, profess to know Christ, and yet you are scrolling through one day and all of a sudden, they're spewing this garbage on Facebook about somebody. About this sorry, good-for-nothing husband that did blah, 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 blah. Or this previous wife or how a friend had done them wrong or how somebody had plotted against them. And I really, uh, you know, I I've come to the place in my life where I pity those folks. I, I mean, just after a lifetime of ministry and and reading and studying the Word of God, most of the time, those people were hurt back here by something that happened in their life, and they haven't been able to forgive and let go. And I'm a Baptist. I'm not a Pentecostal. But I know the Holy Spirit of God just spoke to somebody. We, we have to understand that I told my wife I wasn't going to get excited. Hey, listen, I, I just this isn't in my this isn't in my notes, but 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 I want to read this to you. I think I read it last week too. But in 1 Corinthians chapter two, and 
and verse 9. Write, write, just write the scripture down, the, the chapter and verse. But I, I, want, I want you to hear this. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. Listen, listen to what Paul says. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those that love him. Oh, brother, sister, God has this great and glorious plan for you. You can't even begin to imagine what God wants to do in you and through you. But your unforgiving spirit is a dam that's holding back the blessing of God in your life. Stop it. Forgive it. Let it go. Forgiveness, write this down. A couple things I want you to write down. Forgiveness is the one and first action that leads us into an abundant life filled with freedom. Forgiveness is the one and first action that leads us into an abundant life of freedom. For a lot of Christians, a lot of the troubles, trials, sorrows, and heartaches in their life can all be traced back to a place where somebody, and I get it, man, they were wrong. What they did was messed up. They hurt you. I get it. They broke you. They killed your spirit. I get it. I get it. We can all share those stories this morning. But unforgiveness, write write this down. Unforgiveness, listen, listen. Unforgiveness is the poison that one drinks and hopes that it will kill somebody else. Unforgiveness is the poison that one drinks in hopes that it will kill their enemy. Wow. That's powerful. Unforgiveness is the poison that one drinks in hopes that it will kill their enemy. All you're doing is contaminating your own spirit, your own soul. All you're doing is killing yourself slowly. And the person, and the person that that you're mad at, the person you're angry at, the person that you wish God would kill, the person that you won't forgive, they're going on with their life as though nothing ever happened. Your unforgiveness does not hurt them. It hurts you. Forgive it. (laughs) Let it go and let God. An unforgiving spirit will destroy, listen, An unforgiving spirit will destroy your relationship with others. It will hinder your relationship with God. It will bring sickness to body and soul. It will affect your mind and heart and place you in bondage that will forbid you from moving forward in your life. There's nothing, listen, there's nothing that anyone has done to you that even compares with what men did to Jesus. If he can forgive the ridicule, the mocking, the scourging, the crucifixion, then I ask you, what has anyone possibly done to you? that you can't forgive them. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Now listen, for they do not know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. The people that came against you, the friend that spoke evil of you, that group of people that plotted against you, that husband or that wife that that betrayed you, they didn't realize what they were setting into motion. They didn't even know well, they didn't know what they were going to, what was happening. They didn't, if they, I honestly, many of them, if they knew the hurt and the pain and the sorrow that was headed your way, they never would have done what they done. They didn't know what they were doing. 
They didn't know what they were setting into motion for your life and their life. They didn't know. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. When Jesus spoke those words, whom was Jesus asking forgiveness for? Jesus was asking forgiveness for Pilate because of his cowardice. Pilate found no wrong in Jesus. He found no wrong in the Son of God. And yet, Pilate cursed him to the cross. It was Pilate, it was Pilate who allowed them to crucify him. And Jesus said, Father, forgive Pilate, because he don't know what he's doing. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do, he wasn't just talking to Pilate, he was talking to the soldiers who, 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 who brutalized him. The soldiers, they, they, they beat the Son of God. They scourged him. Do you know what that means? They scourged him? They took a cat of nine tails, that had pieces of bone and rock in it, and over and over and over and over again, they whipped the flesh of Jesus. They tore the flesh away from his bone. And they placed a crown of thorns on his head. And they caused him to carry the cross of Calvary on his shoulder, naked, through the streets of Bethlehem. Tammy and I were there. We walked, we walked the Via Della Rosa, the road to Calvary. We walked, we walked, we literally walked where Jesus walked from Pilate's portico to, 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 to Calvary. And I'll never forget walking along the way, walking along the way, all of these vendors are out there, and all the I'm trying to just experience the moment. I wanted to feel what my Jesus felt. And I'm walking through, and all of these vendors are, are reaching out and touching and trying to get us to buy this and trying to get us to buy that. And I'm the Christian pastor thinking, I'll knock you out, get out of my way. That same day, they were mocking him as he walked the Via Della Rosa with a cross on his back. They were mocking him. They were ridiculing him. When they got atop Mount Calvary, when they got atop Golgotha, I'm sorry, when they got atop Golgotha, they took and they drove nails in his wrist. Six inch spikes. They drove them in his wrist and in his ankle. And it was to them, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it wasn't just Pilate. It wasn't just the soldiers. And Matthew, it says, Jesus, he, he, he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people. He will save the Jews. He will save God's people. And on the Sunday before, as he, as he topped the Mount of Olives and he started his descent through the Kidron Valley and through the Eastern Gate into the Jerusalem, they were laying down palm branches and they were laying down their coats and they were saying, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of God. And four days later, the same group of people were standing at Pilate's portico hollering, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! They had gone from cheers on Sunday to jeers on Thursday. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He spoke of Pilate. He spoke of the soldiers. He spoke of his own people. He spoke of his apostles, his disciples. One betrayed him. One betrayed him and gave him up. Ten, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers came to take him, ten of them got up and run and left him standing alone. And the scripture says that Peter, only Peter, followed from a distance. And as they sat there getting ready to falsely accuse him, three times, three times, they asked Peter, are you not one of his disciples? No, no, I do not know him. Peter denied him. All 12 apostles 
let him down, turned their backs, denied to even know him. And Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But when Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary, it wasn't just Pilate. It wasn't just the soldiers. It wasn't just his people. It wasn't just the apostles, the disciples. It was you, and it was me. Because that Jesus that hung on the cross of Calvary was the Son of God, is God. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It wasn't just the Son of God, it was very God of God that hung on the cross of Calvary. And in his, in his omniscience, he was able to look forward in eternity and see you and see me. Uh, Joe Baisman, we were in Bible study the other night, going through Ephesians, we're looking at spiritual warfare, and Joe Baisman brought up a great point. We were talking about Ephesians 4 and 24, where, where it says that we, 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 we are created in a new life in Christ. We are created to walk, to put on righteousness and holiness in the truth. And Joe said this, he said, you know, it's not just what we put on, it's what Christ put on, on Calvary's cross. We put on his holiness and righteousness today. On the cross of Calvary, he put on your sin and my sin. You think about every evil, spiteful, mean-spirited, ugly, sinful thing you've done in life. Jesus on the cross, he didn't just become sin. He became your sin. He became my sin. And so when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was talking about you and me. What's your problem? Why can't you forgive it? Why can't you let it go? As he has forgiven you, so you must forgive others. What about reasons? Reasons to forgive. Let me go through these with you. We should forgive because God forgave us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you. If you don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive you. Colossians 3.13 says, bearing, listen, to the Christian, you understand that most of what we read, most of what we study, most of what we preach, most of what we teach, it was written to the Christian, not to the lost. Yes, the gospel's here. Yes, there's a message to carry to a lost and dying world. But the vast majority of what we read in this book is for me and you so that we can be the men and women that God called us to be. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving each other Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, all results of unforgiveness, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Eighteen years ago, I loved my minister of music. I still love him. I loved him. He was, he was uh, one of my mentors. And I came into the pastorate very young, and there was a conflict, and he decided to leave. When he left, he showed up at 10 minutes to 11 on Sunday morning, said, I'm resigning I'm resigning today. Tonight will be my last service. I said, don't do that. He said, yeah, God, God told me to. I said, no, God didn't tell you to do that. What I found out after the service that night that he had spent Friday and Saturday 
calling 21 other people in our church, talking to them into leaving. We're that hurt. That hurt bad. That hurt real bad. And I went home that night and I wept. And I cried. It felt like somebody had ripped my heart out. Because these were people that I had loved. That I had poured my life into. That I had cared. I had stood by them while their, while their loved ones passed away. I had been there when their kids were getting through their stuff. I had, I had loved them. I had preached the word faithfully. It, it hurt. I'm not saying I was perfect. There was, there was differences of opinion between the two of us. I get it. And that hurt. And in that moment, I had a choice to make. I could be filled with anger and bitterness and malice. Or I could choose to let God do the bigger work. And that morning at 5 a.m., I walked out on my back patio and I sat down in my swing room. Starting with him, I named every single person by name. And I prayed that God would bless them wherever they go, whatever they do, wherever they end up, that God would bless every one of them. And that God would not hold anything against them. Now, in all honesty, it took me a while. It took several months to get past it all. But I can stand in front of you and tell you that it's all forgiven on both sides. And I can do it. He's with Jesus now. But I can tell you I love that man as much today as I did the day that happened. And I can tell you that many of those people came back to the church. And we went on. It's not me. It's the Lord. But what I'm telling you is the choice to make. And whether we believe it or not, in his sovereignty, he does allow us to make some choices. And we can choose to be filled with bitterness, envy, strife, and malice, and unforgiveness. Or we can choose to forgive and be filled with love, grace, and mercy, and watch what God does through that. Your choice in the matter will determine the direction you go with God. Forgive as he has forgiven you. Number two, infinite forgiveness is to offer to others what God has offered you. Infinite forgiveness is to offer to others what God has offered to you. Matthew 18, 21, 22. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, Jesus said to him. I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, that doesn't mean that you're to forgive them 490 times. Seventy times seven speaks of infinity. No matter how many times it is, as often as they ask for forgiveness, you are to extend forgiveness. And I'll take it a step further. You need to forgive them whether they ask for it or not. Think about Jesus on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they were doing. Get this, child of God, Christian, bride of Christ, wrap your mind around this. Jesus forgave you before you ever did it. <laughs> Jesus forgave you before you ever did it. Before you ever sinned the first time, before you were ever born into this world, before your mom and daddy was born into this world, before your grandmama and granddaddy was born in this world, he had already forgiven you. All you had to do was receive it. Preach, preacher. Infinite forgiving, forgiveness is to offer to others what God has offered to you. Number three, forgiveness is an expression of God's love. Forgiveness is an expression, the ultimate expression, if you will. Forgiveness is an expression of God's love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Listen, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. 
Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Love never fails. Forgiveness is an expression of God's love. Forgiveness opens the door to blessing, number four. Forgiveness opens the door to blessing. Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. So if we're at alt with our brother or our sister, we need to make sure things are right because it hinders Look, you make your sacrifice at the altar. And for us, we're thinking about the prayer altar. Here's the prayer altar. And we come and, and we're seeking and, and we're knocking and we're asking God. Uh, we, we, they're, they're, we need Him to do something in our life. But if we've got alt against our brother and sister, then nothing's going to happen at this altar. Forgiveness opens the door of blessing in your life. Forgiveness is a pathway to answered prayer. We can put it that way. Unforgiveness hinders your prayer life. Unforgiveness hinders your relationship with God. In Acts 7, 54 through 60, we have the ultimate example of forgiveness other than Jesus. But in Acts 7, 54 through 60, concerning Stephen, the deacon. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they, they cried out with a loud voice, they covered their ears, they rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul who became Paul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Listen, then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He died. What a tremendous testimony. I mean, they were stoning him. They, they, they had rocks. They were, I don't know how many were gathered, but they were, they were pump, they, they were killing him. They were beating him. They were, they, they were throwing these rocks and beating him one rock after another. Bam, bam, bam. In the midst of all of that, he says, Father, don't, don't, don't hold this sin against them. I, I'll just stand before you honestly. I don't know that I could do it. I mean, I would want to, and, and you would want to too. But really? I mean, really, let's just be honest and real before we close the service. I would have to think, I'm, I want to say that. I, I want to say... Lord, don't hold this against them. But in my mind, I'm thinking, God, kill them all. But that's not what Jesus would do. And it's no longer you who live, but Christ that lives in you. And if Christ lives in you, then forgiveness is an everyday part of your life. I read this the other day, I, and I forget who said it, but I like it. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. The first to forget it is the happiest. Freedom. Forgiving others as Jesus has forgiven you opens the door of blessing in your life. Forgiving others promotes healing of both body and soul. Unconditional forgiving releases the chains that hold you down 
It unlocks the door that keeps you back. It floods the heart afresh with the love of God and sets the spirit free to soar like an eagle. God has called his people to live a life of freedom, faith, hope, peace, love, and contentment. And it all begins with forgiveness. Let me tell you one story and I'm finished. Pastor Jack Hay- Hayford has got a has got a book. It's uh, I think it's called Through the Bad Days. I've been reading it this week. And he tells the story of a man named Richard. Richard had came by the office to meet with Pastor Jack. And Pastor Jack said that Richard had gotten gloriously saved a few years earlier. Richard was a successful doctor, very skillful, very knowledgeable, very successful. And Richard was a homosexual prior to his getting saved. Someone had introduced Richard to Christ, and Richard had accepted Christ and walked away from the homosexual lifestyle in the community that he was involved in and ended up at Pastor Jack's church. And Richard came by to talk to him about what was going on in his life. The homosexual community had turned completely against him. I mean, because Richard was kind of like, you know, Richard's kind of like the picture of success. You know, here's here's this this homosexual in a homosexual relationship, yet he was a doctor. He had succeeded. He had he had reached the epitome of success. And so in the homosexual community, he's held up, he's he's held up here. And all of a sudden he gets introduced to Christ and he accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior and he forsakes the lifestyle, not the people. He had forsaken the lifestyle that he had been living because he knew in the eyes of God that it was wrong. And when he did that, the homosexual community came against him because for them, he had left us and went to them. He has left us and he went over here to these people that attack us because that's how many homosexuals see the church. And they can present a good case. They can present a good case. We're not always so nice. You know, what we need to understand is you'll go to hell for adultery and fornication just like you will homosexuality. And one's just as much an abomination before God as the other. But God can forgive it all. And God can restore you and God can make you into the man and woman he wants you to be. Anyway, Richard sat down and began to share with with Pastor Jack um, how the community, the the homosexual community, had come against him, how they had ridiculed him and how they had sought to discredit him and and, and tear him down. They were angry. They were mad. They were were vengeful. Pastor Jack said, Richard, Richard responded in love. And kindness. The one who led the charge against Richard, Richard was named Charles. Charles was Richard's lover. And he led the charge against Richard. Richard had done him wrong. Richard had done the whole community wrong. Richard continued to reach out to Charles in a Christ-like way. And so as, as the story go, goes on, Richard had asked Pastor Jack if he would come with him to talk to Charles. What had happened was a few months prior, Richard found out that Charles was dying with AIDS. And so Richard went to Charles' apartment, not knowing what to expect 
He had not seen Charles. He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know if he was going to be cursed. He didn't know if he'd be hit. He didn't know what Charles would do. He said when he knocked on the door, Charles come to the door, and all he said was, oh, it's you. And then walked away, leaving the door open. Richard went into the apartment. And in the story, he says that you could smell death all over the apartment. Charles had open wounds. The house was a mess. The bed was dirty. And it was obvious that Charles was dying. Richard began to clean the house, washed all the dishes, went in and cleaned up all the sores on Charles' body, cleaned the bed, fixed him a meal, and Richard began going back every day for two months doing that. To begin with, Charles didn't say anything. And about two days before he came, or about two weeks before he came to see Pastor Jack, he said, I went in one day, Charles was in bed, I sat down to change his, to change his bandages and, and doctor his wounds. And he said, Charles looked at him and said, so, tell me about this Jesus. And that afternoon, Charles accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And so he had come to get Pastor Jack to go with him to minister to Charles. Because of the way the homosexual community had treated Richard, he had every reason, human mind thinking, he had every reason to be filled with hatred. He had every reason to respond in kind with unforgiveness and bitterness and anger. But he didn't. He responded to Charles and the homosexual community in the same way that Jesus had responded to him. And because of it, two days after that, Charles died and went to be with Jesus. A powerful story of forgiveness. A powerful story of what forgiveness in your life can do. That's who we are. We are a people that forgive because that's Christ-like. We're a people that love unconditionally because Jesus loved us unconditionally. We're a people that forgive because God and only us know exactly what God's forgiven us of. I'm telling you, you don't deserve God's forgiveness. It's a good place for an amen. You don't deserve his love. And I don't either. And in this crowd, I'm the chief of all sinners. I know what he became on that cross for me. How can I not forgive? And forgive infinitely. Because he forgives infinitely. You know, every one of us can stand up and tell our stories about the day we came to Jesus. And I don't think there's a one of us that would stand up in here today and say, you know, I came to Jesus 30 years ago and I ain't sinned since. Liar. (laughs) Yes, you have. And you know what? He forgave you. And he forgave you the next week. And he forgave you the next week. And he forgave you the next day. And he forgave you again that afternoon. That's what he does. Jesus is very good at loving me and forgiving me. He even does it better than she does. I don't deserve it. How can I not do the same thing to the people that have come against me? Your pain is real. Your hurt is real. Your sorrow is real. Your grief is real. All of those emotions are real. It's real. I don't take away from that. And for some of us, it started way back here. But I'm telling you today, God intends for you to live a life of freedom. Amen.
joy of peace. And it begins with forgiving as he has forgiven you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You know, all over, all over America today, people are gathering in churches. And we battle with a lot of different sins in our life. We're, we're not perfect. Hopefully we're striving toward that mark, but, but we're not. We come short in so many ways. But I believe in every church in America, including this one, there are people sitting there this morning who have a mask on. You're hurting. Some of you have been hurting for a few weeks. Some of you have been hurting for years. It's time to take off the mask. Just take it off. Be real before God. Come to him and just say, Father, I want to forgive this, but I can't do it without you. Father, I want to walk fresh. I want to walk in faith. And I want to walk in freedom. Help me forgive them the way you forgave me. Help me, God, to take the higher road. Help me. Help me to be like Jesus. Father God, you know the heart of every person. God, you know if they need salvation, that's where it begins. Lord, if there's a soul that needs saved, and speak to them today about forgiveness. God, just move them to come and receive and believe and confess on Jesus today. But God, most of us here are believers. We know Jesus. He is our Savior. He is our King. But God, a lot of us are battling with a lot of things in our life from yesterday. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, that those words, He whom the Son has set free is free indeed, would become a reality in the lives of every one of us today. And God, we would lay down our past and we would forgive and forget those who have harmed us. And we would fix our eyes on Jesus. We would fix our prize on the we would fix our eyes on the prize set before us. Well, God, help us today to live in freedom and to live in victory. And in Jesus' name. Will you stand? Will you stand? As the Lord speaks to you, will you come? Will you take that thing and just lay it at the altar today? Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to ask questions. Just take it and lay it at the altar and leave it there. Let God do His work in you. His work for you. Will you come? Will you come today? about you while Brandy's praying do you need to come will you come today will you receive the Savior today child of God will you let the Savior do his work in your heart and your life and then free you up
Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We love you and we praise you and we give you the glory that's due your name. God, we thank you for the work that you brought in our heart and our life. Father, we come in the name of Jesus this morning. We pray that we pray, God, that we would go out of here determined to live the life that you called us to. God, I ask to ask you to do your work in our heart and in our lives. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let this world out here see Jesus in us and Jesus through us. God, we thank you for the opportunity. I was glad when they said, come, let us come into the house of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. We have rejoiced and we are glad in it. Fill us, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people said, amen. Hey, just real quick, I want to remind you, Wednesday, if you didn't fill out the form but you're interested, it's a traditional gypsy meal. We'll eat at 5.30 in the gym for the adults. We'll eat at 5.30 in the gym, and then we'll come in here at 6.30 for the, uh, uh, for the testimonies from our missionary. And, and uh, his, his wife is the lady, the girl I told you about that received the shoebox so many years ago, and this is why this ministry exists. So she'll be, she'll be giving that testimony also. But that's Wednesday night, and if you want to come, just fill out one of those sheets so we'll know, or just call Melissa tomorrow or Tuesday and let her know that, that you're going to be coming. But we would love for you to come and join us. Tonight's message, so you want to be a leader. That's the message. <laughs> I want to ask you to come back tonight. First Thessalonians, we're going through that book. Thank you. God bless you for coming today. Yes, ma'am. And she's going to give a testimony. So have a seat. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not much of a speaker, but this lesson really just was laying on my heart and felt like God wanted me to share something with you all. Um, as you know, forgiveness is, is very, very hard to do. And my biological father was a terrible, terrible person. He did everything and anything in the book. And he spent 20 years in prison for what he had done. But for years and years and years, me and my sister both, we have hated him. We, we just wanted him to die. We wouldn't go into his funeral. I mean, it was just, we didn't want no part of any of it. And um, when I was 18, me and my sister decided we were going to go and meet our family. Not him, of course, because he was in prison. But we were going to go and meet our real grandparents and meet the family, aunts and uncles and stuff like that. And, it, and we met them, and it was great, and it was wonderful. And... Um, few years after that he got out and we still had nothing to do with him you know we just wanted to stay away and it was right after we started coming to grace when I started getting God back into my life that all of this happened at once and he became sick and um, a family member had told us that he was you know he was dying this was his last leg he had heart conditions his whole entire life and he had took it all he could take and he was on the dead bed, basically. He, w he was dying in the hospital. And so it was just on my heart, it was so heavy that, you know, I have to forgive this man. I have to forgive him for what he has done. And it took everything that I had, me and my sister both. Keep in mind, we, we had never met him. Um, we went up to the hospital, and we went, we walked in together holding hands so tightly and just said, I just want to let you know that, that we forgive you. We forgive you for what you've done. And he didn't have to say anything, but he did. But he didn't have to say anything. You know, we, we truly had forgiven him for what he had done. And I walked out, and it was just a burden lift off my shoulders. It was such a great thing to be able to do that. Thank you. So you never know the power of forgiveness. And... Uh, and what that looks like. And if God's speaking to your heart, and just like Holly just said, if you've got someone that, that you feel like God's laying on your heart that you need to go ask for their forgiveness or you need to get before them or get before the Lord, make sure you do that today. The Lord's always uh, working in our hearts and lives. And if you've got someone that, that God's laid on your heart, go to them. Find a way to get to them today. Give them a phone call. Do what we got to do to restore that relationship with you and that person so that our relationship between us and Christ can be uh, what it's supposed to be. So... Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. If there's nothing else, God bless you guys, and we will see you this evening.
and choir practice is at 4.30. So if you want to join the choir, it's February Join the Choir Month. So if you want to join, today's a good day. 